The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, it's time for the Bronx Buzz, and tonight's program, uh, we're going to give you a chance, like we always do, at talking to uh, journalists and finding out what they're all about, what they're thinking about, what they're writing about. Uh, and in the case of our first guest, we're going to be talking about the history of uh, an aspect of journalism in the Bronx. Second segment, we're going to talk to a reporter from El Diario who has some very pointed things to say. But right now, I guess the drum roll we need because <laughs> uh, the Norwood News is turning 30 years old. Congratulations to editor David Cruz and the lineage of people before you. Uh, what you. are your thoughts on, at this moment in time, of uh, this n classic neighborhood newspaper? Well, we definitely did not want 30 years to just pass us by without having to celebrate it. And so we're, we're putting together um, a gala on for November 1st at Lehman College from 6 to 9 uh, over at the Music Building. And it's just a way of just celebrating 30 years of what makes the Norwood News a vital paper for Norwood, but also the surrounding areas and also just the entire Bronx as a whole. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's see, we count the date. So it was founded in, I guess that makes it 1987, right? 1988. 1988, of course. My arithmetic already, <laughs> show, I'm showing my, my problem. Uh, so 1988, and um, give me a sense of what it was then and what it is now. And is there a difference, or is it really that's what we did and that's what we still do? Well, when I spoke with Dart Westfall, who is the founder of the Norwood News, who, who then was the vice president of Marshall Preservation Corporation, he wanted a, he, he essentially wanted a newspaper for the neighborhood as a way of just um, shedding light on any issues that were happening within the neighborhood. He had seen other newspapers in other neighborhoods before, and he saw the, how much they worked, and so he decided to sort of expand the mission of Moshua Preservation Corporation by sort of creating a more informed populace. And so in terms of the mission, it's essentially stayed the same, bringing information to people who live in that community to help them become better informed about what's happening and in the hopes of getting them to at least sort of uh, take part or take charge and sort of, you know, I, I think I'm going to use your word, uh, self-determinate. Yes, I, I talk about that all the time and the importance of that. David brought for us this volume, this rather <laughs> impressive volume. This is the Norwood News Volumes 1 to 3, October 1980 to December 1980. And so I, <laughs> I opened it up and I, I will try and hold it up for you. But here it is, volume number one of the Norwood News. You can see it right there. Uh, the headline story, Norwood undergoes mayor sewer, major sewer project. This headline could read today if there was a major sewer. This, right. Oh, in other yeah. words, it would be... <laughs> in it fact, it's happening right now in, in some parts of Norwood right now. Um, and and uh, listen, we, you and I were looking through it at some of these things, um, a, a teen champion, uh, things about um, letters to the editor. I mean, these are all the things that, right. that you do. Um, you are... To my count, the fourth editor of the of the Norwood fifth. News, the fifth. Can we, can we go through the names? Let's see. It was you. So it's, it was Betty Chen. Oh, I wasn't aware of Betty Chen. She was she's the, the first, first editor. editor. Then okay. Helen Schaub, and then Helen knew. Jordan, Moss, Jordan Moss, Alex Kratz, and, and then myself. And you. Um, talk to me about um, the effect or the biggest stories over the years. Things that um, that the Norwood News report. I mean, I know some of them, but uh, I'll let you say it things the Norwood News reported on that uniquely were for Norwood and for the Norwood News that you got more stuff than maybe they get in the Daily News or somewhere else? Well, there are three that I really think about the most, especially having gone through looking at all the archives. Um, three things was the current water filtration plant, 
Right. That was a huge story from the beginning, from the time. I think it was the first mention of it was in 1990, and we're still talking about it to yeah, this literally, day. Yeah, literally, you just <laughs> came out with a story about the water quality, right. which is related to that whole project. Correct, yeah. and uh, so that's, that's one. The second one, of course, the Kingsbridge Armory. Yes, which we're still talking <laughs> about today. Talking so about in today. answer to the question of what's different, nothing's different. It's the same issues. Well, there was one There was one issue that I really um, wanted. I, I think it's, it's a huge... Well, Wait, I don't want you to abandon the Kingsbridge Armory yet. Okay. Um, what the Norwood News did, and some people may remember or didn't oh, yeah, remember, right. was they had a clock, yeah, a countdown kind of, clock, yeah. uh, that counted, I guess, the number of days till it was determined what was going to be in the armory or they were going to actually break ground at, at improving the armory. I don't know at what number the countdown stopped, but... We still don't have anything in that armory. We, we could just still keep it's counting essentially down. the story that keeps on giving. Yeah, um, I guess so. <laughs> and then the last one was a, it was a tragic story about an eight-year-old boy who died in a fire. His name was uh, Deshaun Parker, and he had uh, he he essentially died in what was a building full of neglect. And it I really, vaguely remember this. I don't really remember this. Yeah, it was a just it's a really touching story, it's a sad story. And Jordan Moss, he really he really delved deep into that story, just the circumstances that led to it, the aftermath, and his story was essentially used um, as an example in a in a graduate school class. And and the relationship between that sort of incident and way buildings are cared for, and the ownership of the buildings, I, I, I do remember that. One of the things that the Norwood News has to be credited with is um, uh, be, partially because of Dart uh, Westfall, who gets the credit uh, for having founded it, nor, um, Jordan Moss, who was the editor for like 17 years, um, is that it, it, it really influenced community journalism. And there were spin-off papers. Uh, um, I, I forget already what they were called. The Tremont Tribune, right? And the Mount Hope Monitor, uh, the Mount Hope Monitor, and I think there was the Highbridge Horizon. Correct. That, that Although all that, those, the first two that you mentioned, Mount Hope Monitor and Tremont Tribune, they were created by MPC. Highbridge um, Horizon was a separate paper, but they right. all fell under the Bronx News Network. Right, and and so this really to me is a major part of the legacy, the, the current legacy, because it's not gone, going away, we assume, of the Norwood News, is that not only was it a community pa uh, newspaper, but it created the template for other newspapers. Now, you know, we, you know we have a problem with journalism and having them, you know, perpetuate, but the Norwood News is the standard, and, and congratulations for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. We've, we've tried to be consistent over the years, and I'm glad that we had really great editors. And I, and I, and I mean it 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, just having read Jordan and Alex Kratz and Helen Schaub and Betty Chen's work, it just I, I try to model that as much as, as I can. Um, and, and also, uh, I guess this is related to all of what I was just saying, the vision that... Um, you know, that, that it's not only about us, it's about this concept is good for a community. Correct. Right? And that, just the nonprofit model itself. It's a nonprofit newspaper, right. which at the time was, was kind of relatively new. It was not being done before. Everything was very for profit, it was driven by advertising revenue, whereas the Norwood News was sustainable because of the revenue that MPC was producing through its ownership of buildings. Right, and I want to mention MPC because maybe we made a, an assumption that we ought not to make. Um, MPC is the Marshall Loop Preservation Corporation. Talk to me about that organization, what it has meant, which is everything to the <laughs> Norwood News, and even then, is there a relationship then with Montefiore Medical Center, which is of course right uh, across the street and around the corner from right. where you are. Marshall Preservation Corporation is a support nonprofit of Montefiore Health System. And in terms of the work that we do, we do a lot of community development, we do a lot of economic development, and we do beautification of Norwood itself. And over the past, I would say, actually over the past year, we've tried to strengthen our relationships with community-based organizations like Friends of Marshall Parkland. They now have um, an office. A oh, and even an office in the, in the building, in the in old the building stone house itself. there. Right. And so we really try to bring back, or at least you know, maintain that mission of neighborhood preservation. And we haven't... Uh, uh, um, among the other things, we need to mention uh, BronxNet and WFUV have a oh, relationship right, yeah. with the Norwood News. So again, it's, it's not only the, the newspaper, but it's really it's this vision that 
Good community media is, is a good thing. Um, and the other thing, um, and you have one of your interns here, you've done a really good job at developing interns. I mean, it becomes, again, more than just the news, maybe if, that was, if I was writing a headline, more than just the newspaper for 30 years. Right, yeah, we, we really, it, 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 you're right. It's definitely not just putting together news stories. I mean, there's much more to our paper than, uh, then I guess we give ourselves credit for. Sometimes when you when you say it, it's like I don't really think about it, but it's true. You know, we have had a uh, lot I, of good things. David, before we uh, let you go, I want to give you a chance because you talked about Dart's work and Jordan's work and other people's work. What's the best story that you did? What's your favorite story for yourself? And how many years have you been the editor there? Almost five. Oh, wow. It'll Who be knew? December, <laughs> December 2013. But, but uh, so, what's your own? What, what stick when you say, "Gee, what have you done? What, what was good for you at the Norwood News?" Well, my my story that I really think about off the top of my head was the story about this uh, group of buildings that were experiencing a massive uh, heat issue after it was purchased by the related companies and. There were the people over there, they were really, they, it was in the middle of winter and there was no heat in their buildings. Mm -hmm. And so... You've got to be quick because they're waving me off here. It turns out the buildings were owned by the related companies who purchased the, the buildings through city money, through the pension fund. Right. And so Scott Stringer, who's the controller, had to step in and get and so the you, building so in So again, order. yet again, um, you know, the story of tracking landlords and buildings and management and how that relates to the health of the community, the development of the community. Congratulations. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, David didn't say it. I'm going to be one of the honorees right. at, the, at the November 1st gala. I'm, I'm, you know, tickled pink to be recognized by my peers and people who I love and respect like David Cruz and, and all the people you mentioned who have been part of the, this movement in community journalism that the Norwood News represents. Congratulations. Thank you. 30 years. And by the way, if you want tickets and you want to attend, and I wish you would because... I don't want to have my big moment in front of nobody. <laughs> then just go to norwoodnews.org and right. you could click in and, and they're as inexpensive as you'll get. And um, it'll be a lot of fun and you'll support community journalism in the Bronx. Thank you so much. Thank All you. right, we're taking a break. We'll be back. El Diario will be represented here. Don't go away. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. I was living on the street, and one night, me and this Cocker Spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self. And I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma, too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son. It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am going to get you. I'm going to get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. It's a short drive from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.com.
Okay, back with you in the Bronx Buzz. Uh, it's like when we last saw our heroes, when we last saw t tonight's guest, um, he was, uh, I guess, working out in Long Island. Uh, I don't want to say an obscure show, but it, it wasn't maybe the most popular. And since that time, he's done TV, he's moved on, and I was just telling him, congratulations, he's earned it. Uh, my, my friend, Jose Martinez, <laughs> congratulations for Thank everything you, that uh, you have been doing and um, uh, you will be doing. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, what you are currently doing. Could we get uh, Jose on the camera there? We don't, there you go, there he is. Um, so um, uh, tell me about uh, what you're doing. You're working for El Diario now, right? Yeah. That is a step up. A lot of things have happened uh, since the last time I came. You want to recount real I, quick? I, there's a lot. You know, but, you know, part of it, it's you know, the result of being out. I went to Pennsylvania for a month, and I had a, a great experience, kind of like uh, putting myself out to a different public. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, TV, you did some TV. TV, right? yeah, I was doing TV there. It's a completely, you know, Republican audience. Uh, it's a different public, and yeah, it, it that was, was really that was good. a challenge given all the, the immigration work you had done and yeah. what you had done representing on Long Island. It, it was really good, and then now I'm back in the city, um, working for El Diario, mm -hmm. um, covering City Hall and NYPD, which is amazing. It, it's a, there's a lot of things happening. Yeah, I uh, can't imagine <laughs> there's anything going on at the NYPD and City Hall. But it's also interesting, you know. It's you're right there. I'm right there with the cops every single day. And then I get that sense from them, and then I go out to the communities and talk to the people. So it's like I don't have to call them. I don't have to email them. I can go and talk to them right, right. there, and that makes it completely different. And, and different. one of the things you learn, and, and I've worked in a, a, number of, uh, a number of media outlets. I mean, I did work at Channel 4 one time, and I worked at, at Fox, uh, uh, New York, uh, Fox Sports. And one of the things, when you go and, and you were the same guy, that when you were in Long Island, but now that you are representing El Diario, all of a sudden you are able to command those dialogues a little more. And I know when I used to hold the microphone that had the NBC logo, all of a sudden people would stop and talk to you. Not that they don't for Bronx Net, but there is a different sense of it. Yeah, yeah, and it, and I think it's good. I think you, you know you kind of like create the path for yourself, and, and you start building the sources and and it's easier to get the information that you're looking for. Uh, you were telling me, and now we're going to break some news right here, you were telling me what you're working on, and, and so what are you working on for El Diario, and what are we going to see? When is it coming out? Tomorrow? Well, yeah, Thursday? tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. Well, the, the first thing I want to show you, uh, and this is in English, which is good. Uh, <laughs> which is good for, for Gary, me. Yes. yes. But basically... The Right to Know Act, yes. Right. This is very important, and this is critical. This starts tomorrow, so if you're stopped by the... Uh, by an NYPD officer tomorrow on the street, you have something that we already had before, but now it's a law. So if they they want to take your bag, if they want to get in your car, they're going to have to explain why are they doing that. They can't just do it just because they want to. So there's there's got to be something. Gives community people a little more rights. Now, they have to explain it. Um, they put it in writing or they just tell you. They say, the, we're going to be searching your car because... Right. And then you're going to have to give your consent. If you don't give your consent, then uh, you have to ask, am I arrested? Uh, you know, you can't deny to, uh, to be, you know, to give them your things. But um, the reality behind that and what the council members are, are doing right now is kind of like studying what's going to happen with these uh, two laws. Is that going to actually work? Because we've seen the NYPD doing many things, mm -hmm. even though there, uh, there are laws already protecting citizens. Right. So, so, that, so here's the question, um, and maybe you're close to it. What are the officers saying? Are they saying, look, you know, I'm able to find guns or find drugs because I can be a little more aggressive? Or do they understand that this is the natural thing and they're going to be able to do their police work? And then on the other side, are community members saying, aha, thank goodness. And are you concerned that maybe people who want to do wrong will be using this as an excuse to do something wrong? Well, as Whether hold a gun or drugs or whatever. Well, as part of the police reform, it is a good step for the communities. The communities are ready to uh, engage in those conversations with police officers. And they're getting trained by the NYPD to do those kind of interactions. So right now, we don't know what's gonna happen, and this is kinda like tomorrow, oh. and probably in January, we're gonna have results 
of this and then uh, we new keep policy. reading uh, Jose Martinez and El Diario, and we'll we'll find out all about it. You, for um, a long time, and we had many dialogues, especially during um, the, the the 2016 presidential campaign, the run up to that, and the dialogues about immigration, something you covered extensively out on Long Island. Um, you were telling me before, and I had never heard this phrase before: the public charge. Um, talk to me about what that is, and, and I will tell you as somebody who's kind of watched Jose's career develop a little bit, it's fun to know that you did all that groundwork, and now when it comes to really interpreting big things, you're in a position to interpret it for people, especially people who read Spanish language who have many issues in this well, regard. Thank you for saying that, first it's of all. Okay. Um, well, public charge is uh, it's something that if you don't know about it, I didn't know about it either, but yeah. uh, basically a lot of immigrants that are out there don't know what it means. So there are organizations trying to explain what's going to happen with this change. The thing, this already exists. So what they do is that the government is behind immigrants and, and they're checking what are they doing um, if they're getting food stamps, if they live in a NYCHA building, right. if they're getting any sort of uh, federal... Public uh, assistance. Exactly. So, so it, there is a database. I mean, that exists. It's a yeah. public document, right? Yeah, right now there are 75,000 immigrants in New York City that could be affected by and, this And in change. what way would they be affected? So let's say, now are these undocumented people or are these people no. who are just came from another place? It, it, these are regular immigrants that could be maybe in... Uh, applying for some kind of uh, relief or they're in some kind of already immigration process, not for undocumented. Undocumented immigrants do not, Would not get have a any, okay, they so don't get any, any public who's in system. the process of applying for either a green card or a citizenship. Right, correct. Okay, and if they are and they get uh, a public assistance of some sort, um, uh, whether it be food stamps or whatever, what could what happens or well, what could happen well, to them? The, 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 the big change is the government used to see the person, for example, if you were marrying a person, if you're getting married and, and you're applying for a green card, then the government used to see your partner, the U.S. citizen that was applying for you. Right, right now, the government is going to look both people. So. They're going to see if you're going to be a public charge for the government. They don't want people that are going to come here to go to the doctor for free or get food for free. They want people that could become a resident that could also afford to live here. So that's the so big So you're going change. to be evaluated on a... Yes. Now, and then what happens if you don't pass some sort of standard? I mean, you, you, could, you, be, get, you, you could, could be deported. deported. Right. Be deported. Yeah. So right now, that's the thing. You know, the message for people is go to a lawyer and, you know, analyze it. It's Deal not, with it right away. Well, it's not, it's not implemented yet. It's on a 60-day analysis, uh, but it could be implemented very soon. And so that's why if someone is in that position, they should go to a lawyer and have a conversation. I already did this in the past. I got food stamps in the past. Maybe the lawyer will say, don't do it anymore or keep doing it until it becomes a law. Hmm. So it depends on many things right now. It, it, it's a, a fascinating thing, and, and it, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to evaluate it. I guess we'll take a deep breath and watch what happens a little bit. I mean, it, what, what I, I guess bothers me most is the splitting up of families, and I wonder if uh, the punishment fits the crime, so to speak. That, that, in other words, I understand people breaking the law. I mean, this gets into kind of an editorial yeah, point of view. But that, that is my concern, is that, okay, so they did, quote, unquote, break the law by entering the country or using resources or whatever it is. But should the punishment, um, does, does the punishment of deportation possibly breaking up a family, possibly hurting a family, does that fit that crime? In other words, if you steal something that's a bad crime, we don't cut your hand off because that doesn't fit the crime. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, Maybe it, detained for a couple of years as opposed to destroying families. That's what my main concern is. Yeah, well, is. the public charge is going to affect also families that are, uh, that, or, that have uh, U.S. citizens, that are, the kids that are U.S. citizens. So the kids are already applying to get food stamps, but their parents are undocumented. So these parents could be affected in a process in the future. Wow. So that's that's where the so problem is. So you ends. will be writing about it. It'll it, it's out there already, and yeah. you'll be following it. It's one of the things that's of concern and of interest. 
Um, I, I also want to go into another uh, kind of beat that you have, uh, um, I guess we're a little bit out of order because it's related to criminal justice and what we were talking about before, uh, and that is uh, Crossroads in Brooklyn, which is a juvenile detention center. Now, we have in the Bronx, and everybody knows, uh, the Horizon Juvenile Center, which has had big issues with moving um, uh, teens out of Rikers, and they haven't been able to square that away yet. I mean, I don't think there's any question. Tell me about Crossroads. You had a, a tour. Talk to me about what that facility is like. Well, Gary, it was shocking. It was, really? it was a shocking experience. I've never been to a det detention center for adults or for kids, nothing. <laughs> so I guess I, that's I, the good I, news. He's been on yeah, the right well, side that, of the law. That's a good thing. But, um, you know, it was a shocking experience. What was shocking? Because, you know, this was uh, right before the kids were going to start the new, the new year in school. And these kids were getting ready to go to school inside this, this detention center. And they opened the door only to go to school. So they go to school right there, but they have to pass in the doors facility. and doors and doors right. and doors. Right. And, and it's kind of like that is not the experience that, I had when I was 15 or 16 years old. Well, of course, old. you were you were not incarcerated. Did you get a sense? Did you see um, any of the inmates, and did you get a sense of their condition or I their attitudes or anything like I that? I had conversations with them. The, you're not allowed to, you know, post any picture or their names or anything. Okay. But you know, but he's talking about it on TV, so we like that. Yeah, no. In in my report, you can you can see you can read some of this. The, that sense that I had there with these kids. And mm -hmm. I, I personally had a, an experience with my nephew because I have a nephew that he was born here, but he's Latino, he's, uh, mm -hmm. he looks like me. And then I saw this kid at the det detention center and, and I felt like, okay, he looks like my nephew. So there are many things happening so, before the kid goes but, to a detention center. But let's go back, center. so answer my question. What did, what did they say? What, what is your evaluation well, of how they were doing? If they go to school, is it meaningful? Are they able to, I mean, we all hope we're rehabilitating them. Did you get a sense that that's happening, that they're cared for, that they eat sufficient food? Yeah, no, the, 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 the facility is, is beautiful inside. Okay. They have everything. There's a school, there is a park, there are, there, there's everything for them. And, you know, when I went there, they were having, of course, a time to read, and they were reading with the director and yeah, all that. I'm sure you didn't see the worst. Exactly, the so worst that, is, that is the other part. But, I, you know... Talking about their the way they live, they live pretty well, and it's it, and, it, and it's comfortable. Uh, what I mean is the behind that, you know, behind those stories, what's happening to these kids to end up in a detention center. So one of them told me he was being bullied at school, so he joined a gang to kind of like defend himself from the guys and who were bullying him. Into and then he got it. Listen, Jose, we could talk about this stuff for a very long time, but right now we're out of time. Uh, and thank you so much. Congratulations on the new thank work. You. One of the things I'm gratified by because I know that he's going to work hard. He's going to be diligent. He's going to be, you know, kind of, kind of do the right thing. And, and that's nice to know that we've expanded the circle uh, in that way. Thank you thank so you. much. No, thank you. Jose for Martinez, me. we're going to have you back. You're going to follow course. up on all this stuff. <laughs> all right. So guess what happens now? Now we say uh, good night because that is the end of uh, the Bronx Buzz for this evening. We will be back next week. Uh, with more talk on, um, on the Bronx Plus. Also, don't forget uh, Bronx Talk Monday night. We're going to talk about prospects of an animal care shelter in Cobb City. Some people like it, some people don't like it. We'll do that on Bronx Talk Monday night. Good night.